Guys, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation. We begin the last two chapters of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21 is where we'll find our reading today. We believe it'll be a tremendous time because we're in a process of transition in the sense of there's no longer going to be evil. Um, there's not going to be an antichrist anymore. There's not going to be a final war. We're past all of that. There's not going to be a um, period of unrest. And even after the millennium, there won't be a millennium anymore. All time has ceased to exist. And as a result, we are now headed to our final goal, and that is heaven. We're going home. And that's what's exciting about these last two chapters of the Bible. So I want you to, if you will mind, stand as we read. This will be the only time we'll do this in these next last two chapters, is we stand to read these eight verses for today. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. I really, when you get to verse 3 and 4, I think they're probably the best verses in Revelation because we are in the end game. And so it's an amazing time. So Revelation chapter 21. And if Marty, if you wouldn't mind hitting that button because we are losing power. We appreciate that. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's why we sang the song, John the Revelation, Revelator. He saw the holy city coming down. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place for the tabernacle of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye, eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, no pain anymore, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who has, was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Verse 3, 4, and 5, it's not an angel. It's even not the son. It is God speaking. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son but as for the cowardly this is the only negative verse that we're going to find in this chapter as for the cowardly the faithless the detestable as for murderers and sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and how many liars all liars how many liars all, all liars we'll talk about that next week their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death let's go to the lord in prayer our father we're thankful for this morning for what it means to us in the fact that we are in the final stage truly eternity it's heaven lord and we can't wait to get there we understand that as we toil here on earth you have called us as we've been talking about these last few weeks for a purpose the mission that you've laid before us this great time of witnessing as it seems all the world is in such trouble now. We pray, Father, that we will not miss this opportunity to serve you. We 
till you come. We're asking, Father, that you would be with those who could not be with us today. We're praying, Father, for those who are sick and those who are carrying pain. And Lord, we pray, Father, for those who are even fearful to get out still. We pray, Father, for those that are suffering persecution around the world. Lord, we pray for those who are going through emotional trauma and stresses of this life. We're asking, Father, that they will learn and join with us and find the confidence that we can have that even though it may seem like all hell's around us, we are citizens of heaven and we know you. We give you all the praise this morning. We give you all the glory. We thank you for what it has done for us, Lord, in understanding just who you are, that you will dwell with us, you will tabernacle with us. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the DC universe, that's not Washington, DC, but in the DC comic universe, comic books, movies, you have their two main heroes. A third hero would be Wonder Woman. She was kind of a little bit of a later, later rival, but it's Batman and Superman. Of the two, Batman is most popular. I have a theory for that. And it is true that Batman is the darker of the superhero. Superman is more the lighter, uh, uh, positive one of the superheroes. And that they will work together at different times, but they contrast because Batman is the scarier one. He's on the dark side. And this bears out to where they live, their hometowns, okay? Batman, his city is what? Gotham. That's right. I knew if anyone would answer that question, that would be the man. Good answer, Gotham. Superman's hometown, or not hometown, but his city that he works from, his base is? Metropolis, okay? Gotham comes from the word goth, which means to be dark. It means to be disruptive. It's literally the word in Latin, rude. And you can see how Batman is that way, right? In this fictional account. By the way, it is fiction. I need to remind some of us that, okay? It's not real. But then Superman comes from Metropolis. He comes from Metropolis in its origins talks about the city of light. It talks about the city of the future. And that's where when you contrast it in, as going back into the later dates of those comic books, one was always the darker, played off the one that was the brighter. And that's what we kind of have here. A lot of, of, of these connotations come directly from the Bible in fictional art. This is what we see here. We are now at the true metropolis, the true city of light, the one that is for real, not Gotham, not Satan city. And if you want to carry that analogy a little bit further, I'd call it Babylon, okay? We definitely see that. And, and if you think about those contrasts even a little bit further, when the movies came out, the dark side of those things, Batman never saw the sun. It was always gray. It always seemed rainy, and it was very industrial. Superman had to go up into the sun to get his strength, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? That's what that yellow sun did that for him. And, and so these things played off each other, the sun even being the picture of us. The two Jewish writers wrote that Superman comic book knowing that they were showing a Messiah mimicking the, the, the Gentile Christian believers, Jesus Christ. Well, we know who the true Superman is. We know who the true hero is. And he is our Lord. And he is our Savior. And now his metropolis, the city of light, not lights, is coming down. And John the Revelator got to see it. Now, some would say that when they think of heaven, it's not clouds and angels and harps. They would think of it as kind of like a utopia. John Lennon sung about a utopia being on earth. Now, a problem with heaven being a utopia, I wouldn't go that far in there because when you study the word and you look the word up, utopia literally means not peaceful. It's the Greek word. It is literally not a real place. That's what it's from in the word you, you meaning no or not, and then topia, a place. And so 
It's not utopia. This is place. This is real. And I'm asking you today, why do we live like it's someplace so far away that it's so unattainable that we don't think about it and we don't rationalize how we are citizens in heaven? As a believer in the 21st century, in modern world, I believe it's important for us to understand and to apply this goal in our lives because it will change our walk and change us in the area of holiness. Much like we talk about with the second coming. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, and we've used that scripture, Titus chapter 2, so many times that it will purify you when you think of the second coming. I believe that when you think of heaven as your final destination, it motivates you to work for it as a citizen of heaven here on earth, hoping to see people come along that way. John, in this chapter, sees this happening. A new city, a new earth. The old has passed away. It's gone now. And in that culmination, he doesn't speak to angels. He is speaking to God himself in this chapter. So, what I think, and this is, for me, the quote that I would like to have is that if you are living on this earth and you have all the accoutrements of world pleasures with you right now, you need to realize how second class that is compared to what God has in store for you. And that we need to grasp hold of that. I, I hope you understand that. I hope you see that. Now, I want to show you the scripture here because in, in Hebrews chapter 11, we used this a few weeks ago. Abraham was not looking for the promised land. He was looking for something else. Jacob knew that the promised land was going to be Israel because of the promises that was given. Abraham did not receive those promises as revelation was progressing. Obviously, Moses, and then handing off the baton to Joshua, saw the promised land and understood that that was going to be Israel's abode. But for Abraham, I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, the, the Hall of Faith chapter. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. The writer of Hebrews spends a lot of time talking about the high priest of God and literally the high prophet of God being Melchizedek and, and a king, possibly Jesus Christ himself. Abraham was looking for something beyond all of that. That's why he didn't care to live in nothing but tents. He could have made himself a nice place. He was a wealthy man. He kept his abode in a tent, what the old King James would call tabernacle. Are you connecting this with the dwelling place of God? It was something that he was not caring to live around the world he was living in. He was thinking otherworldly. I want you to look at that verse again. Look carefully at it. It's a few words here. Verse 10, chapter 11. He's looking for the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So he was looking for that city, and he was applying it to what we see here literally in chapter 21. This is it. Listen, believer, born-again Christian, we are not to be tied down to this world. We are to push back on all the things this world has to offer because they are the things that bring us distraction that further makes us lose our holiness and our power. The power of God is brought in your life by having less and not more. Now I'm going to say that again. The power of God coming in your life, I know what all the evangelists on TV will teach you, and I'm saying just the opposite. The power of God coming in on your life will be getting away from the things of this world. Finances, houses, vehicles, retirements, even the things of family. We have nothing else but this. But with this, listen to me, 
We have it all. We have it all. It is what God has prepared for us. I want you to notice Psalm 73. Or, well, and this here we see in, in, the, in the passage here, the, the, the citizenship. That, well, let's go back here. I want you guys to know, I actually have them in reverse here. Hold on. Turn to Psalm 73. Let's turn there. Because it's not on the screen. It probably didn't get saved. Y'all grab your Bibles. Turn to Psalm 73, okay? Because this I don't want to lose. This is the mindset that the psalmist had that was so similar to Abraham. I, I can't tell you and stress to you this enough. We literally will start, and this is not David writing this. This is the song leader of the Levitical uh, tribe who is now bringing this here. But look at Psalm 73. And I'm going to go, if you're there, say amen. I'm going to go towards the end of the psalm. It'll probably, probably, uh, I'll miss some of these verses because I, I thought I had them on the screen, but not. But I wanted to look at verse number 21. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was brutish and arrogant. Psalm 20, 73, verse 22. I was uh, brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. The psalmist is admitting he's frustrated with God because he has so little. And the whole chapter of, uh, uh, goes to talk about before this is that he has not as much as the lost people have. And he surely doesn't have as many tribulations. The lost people seem to have all the nice things. They don't seem to be bothered as much. It's easier for them. They get ahead in this world. Okay? But now look at verse number 20, 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me. What's the last word there in verse 24? To glory. To glory. That's what's being reminded in the turning point that comes in the psalmist's life. Who then, verse number 25, who have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. You will not have Christ fully until you have nothing at all. And that's the mindset that God has called us to be, is that these things in this world do not matter. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish, you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Do you see the contrast that we need to see? Why do we look so much like the world? Why are we so in step with the world? We need to be like that salmon that goes against the stream and goes against the flow and it makes the power of God Real in our lives and heaven that much sweeter. We don't cherish heaven because we're so distracted by the things of this world. I'm not talking about just being a minimalist. Min min how do you say it? Minimalist. Minimalist would be someone who's trying to get in your head. But what, I, what I'm saying is, is that we need to let go. Less is more. John Bunyan, when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress in 1678, he wrote it in two parts. In 83, he put the second part in. It, it's about Pilgrim, and it's, it's online, it's free. You should read it. It's hard to get through it the first time, but the more you read it, the more you understand. They have books and books that try to help you. Try, it's fairly flat out there once you get past the Old English. But it's Pilgrim who has got one desire, and that is to take the journey to get to Celest Celestial City. And as he's trying to get to Celestial City, he realizes that his own efforts and all the things that he's trying to do and anything that he gains of himself fails and he falls flat. And he's able to come through by certain witnesses of people who he comes in contrast, no hiding, they give the names right exactly who they are. One's evangelist, he's the witness. One's Christian who will help him grow in his life in Christ. John Bunyan, the preacher, as he's writing this, is writing this from jail. He's writing this being in prison because he would not follow the government's 
mandate on how preachers would be, where they were supposed to be certified from. So Bunyan is going against the curve, and he's fought going against the things of this world. There are times we need to do the same as believers and not grab into the flow and streams of society. When it, what is interesting is that Pilgrim is his main character. That's what he's called, Pilgrim, right? He finally gets saved about midway through the journey. He becomes born again, and that's the only way he's going to make it to Celestial City. And it's when evangelists, this man tells him, you can't go in but any other way. You must go in by the narrow gate. And he literally calls it the wicked gate because it's so unappealing. It's, it's not something that's broad. It's not something that's beautiful. It's not something that's paid. It's the wicked gate. And you're going to make that choice because you're going against the stream is what he's saying. And then comes Christian that helps him grows with the struggle. And eventually it's through the power of the cross that he unburdens himself with the things that are, are frustrating in his life. But he becomes at that point going into the wicked gate a citizen. And this is where I do give you this passage here in Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven. For, and from it, we await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't say dual citizenship, did it? Did it? No. It says our citizenship, who will transfer, I love verse 21, our lowly body into his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. How amazing and how powerful is that, that we're who God called to be. Now, my outline is very simple with this chapter here. We're going home, okay? Now, I want you to look at verse number one. It's a new creation. Verse two, it's a new city. Verse three, he gives us a new covenant. He doesn't have to bring an old covenant in, verse three and four. And then in chapter 21, we will bring out more next week than any other time, a new changelessness. Don't you, don't you hate how everything changes? It's always changing here, but it won't be that way. The new will stay new. And that's the beautiful thing about God's creation. So chapter 21 is going to bring something. And I'm not going to go through the list again. I don't want to bore you. You can go back to chapter 21 now and turn back there. Chapter 21, what it does is it brings some other things that have never been recorded in Revelation and in the Bible. It's bringing things that we have not seen before. Chapter 21 is great at doing this. And Revelation is great at doing this. I have a long list that I've given you several times over of the new things that are mentioned in Revelation. They're not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. But we'll not go through that right now. But I do want to point out this. It is the only two chapters, chapter 21 and chapter 22, that give us any detailed description about heaven. That's it. Everything else that we learn about eternity are things as far as God is concerned, which I think is rightly so. But chapter 21 and chapter 22 are for us and where our resting home is going to be. And that's it in the Bible. It's, it's huge in the sense that this is the only descriptions. I was looking to think that it was the Old Testament that didn't have it. It's really the New Testament. We understand what Paul said when he went through the third heavens, but it, it, he doesn't really give any descriptions of what that was like, okay? So we see the first heaven being the atmosphere, the second heaven literally being the, the universe itself, and then the third heaven is the heaven that's not seen. But we don't know anything else but that. Someone once said, and, and they asked the question, how can I... How can I determine the official church's position on the view of heaven from the Bible? And you know what the pastor wisely said back to him? Die. He said, that's the only way you're going to ever really know. Because we don't really have it. We don't know. It is a mystery to us. But what we do have is from chapter 21 and from chapter 2. And chapter 22. So Western culture pushes back on this. And I think that's part of the reason why. Is because we don't have, they, we're so <laughs> wanting knowledge that sometimes too much knowledge hurts us. Y'all hearing me? It hurts us. 
And all my life I was told, read, 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 study, study, study. But guess what, guys? Sometimes you can overdo it when God is just wanting the simple thing. So our culture pushes back on this, and it's always done that. But I think here of late, even worse so. The, the question of heaven. 40 years ago, it was the question of hell. And many churches would preach that hell does not exist. Now, it's almost like it, it, we don't know what it is. And they'll, they'll bleed in Eastern mysticism. They'll bleed in all these different things of thoughts that people have. I'll go one step further. Even our Christian music has changed so much. We had a lot of songs. And some of them were not quite as accurate, okay? You know, heaven is, is like going to get to it through going on a railroad or, or a mansion over a hilltop. It's not just a mansion. I've, I've got a mansion over a hilltop. It is God's dwelling place that we all live in. So we all understand that. But a lot of songs were written about heaven, especially in the late 1800s, all the way through in our country, through the Depression, up to World War II. And there were a lot of songs about heaven. Now, it's rare. Most of the songs, and, and I do realize that many of the songs that we talk about as our praise and worship to, to the Lord, but yet heaven should still be on our mind. It's home, guys, and we're going home one day. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know we're going. I will credit Chris Tomlin on this. It needs to be mentioned that the last four years, he's written two major songs on heaven. I, I, I encourage you to look them up. They're beautiful, and I surely applaud him. And I think he saw the need for it. I really do, because I think he said to himself that we're seeing us getting away from a belief of what the end game is all about. And I really do believe that we lose power along the way when we don't think like heavenly thoughts, because we're chasing these really frivolous pursuits. We get so distracted, okay? How much in your daily activity, in your daily routine, do you think about your home and your citizenship in heaven? I, I will tell you, I think more a lot. I think a lot about the second coming, and it does purify my thought life. But it, from purity should come power, and the power will be the fact that you know you're a citizen, you're a priest, you are a, a chosen, chosen priesthood of of heaven itself. We've heard the expression, and you all have heard this. I want y'all to look up here. You've heard this expression. They've said it about faithful Christians before. The world will say it. Well, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly one. Well, he's no earthly what? Good. Good, good yeah. He's so heavenly minded, he's no, what's, he's no earthly good. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with being heavenly minded, you're no earthly good? Think about that statement. Now, believe me, it's applied to when you, they, they can't do things, just normal structured things in life. Not saying that you need to be a rocket scientist, but yes, you need to know the basic chores of life, of just taking care of and having a disciplined life. That's not what the statement is saying, though. The statement is saying they're not any good on earth. Sign me up. I don't want to be good on earth. I want to be heavenly minded. I want to be structured because as a result, that's where my power comes in and the purity of, of goodness will become because of the second coming. That's the point. So I have no problem with people saying, oh, you're so heavenly minded. I'm going to go this, push this a little bit further here. I want you all to think for a minute and challenge me on this because you look it up. If I'm wrong, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Okay. I can't find a verse in, especially in the gospels. Jesus promised us on earth food and raiment, clothing. Okay. I can't find a verse where he promised us housing. Don't see it. Oh, it's in there. I've looked. And I could, if there's, it, it, maybe I'm just missing it. It might be in there. Food, as a believer, raiment, clothing. We don't have any problem with that here in this country, do we? We got too much food and we got too many clothes. You know it's bad when the missionaries in Mexico says, please quit sending us clothes. Thanks to Walmart and all these other big department stores, we got so many clothes around here, we don't need any more clothes. Shoes are all over the place. It happens in special needs. I'm looking at seeing Susan there, and she knows that there are times there are people who need it. But for the most part, most people, it's not a need anymore, is it? It becomes a want on clothing. Our Lord had how many pieces of clothing? 
You see what I'm saying? So, no promise of a house? No, I, I don't think so. I think there's a reason for that. This, we have a home there. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, and he lived in tent. I'm just saying. Oh, we can't do that nowadays. Why not? Why not? You ready to go home? I'm ready. I'm ready to go home. I've been exploring this and, 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 and trying to study this out as much as I possibly can, but I want you to know I'm preaching from my heart here today. I hope that I'm around a church that's so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I want to be around people like that. I want, hopefully, in the next couple of weeks to whet your appetite right before Easter so that we will see the Bible and what it says about heaven in ways that we've never seen. This world and the world that Adam messed up is, and yes, Christ will restore it in the kingdom, but it's not going to stay that way. The final restoration, the final thing that's made right is heaven. Now, I want to give you just a list of, of a, a circle of here. I'll, I'll go through these quickly. There's about 13 of them. I put these together in different orders. I saw it on several lists here. Paradise lost and paradise is restored is, is obviously what we're talking about. Adam lost it. Christ is going to restore it. But number one, human history started with a garden, but now it's ending with a city, a city coming down. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Genesis 1 1. John says in chapter 21, listen, listen, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. How powerful is that? The darkness, number three, he calls night, it relates to my Batman story. But then in Genesis 1 5, but there is no night in Genesis 21, verse 25. The Father and the Son are the light. God, number four, had two great lights. You know, the, the earth, the sun, sun, moon, in Genesis 1 16. But we have no need of that in heaven. In the day, number five, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That was the forbidden fruit. You know what? And, and that's how they die in, in Revelation 21, verse 4. There'll be no more death. Satan appears as a deceiver and right in the beginning there in chapter 3 of Genesis. But he is gone. He is gone. Are y'all hearing me? He's gone. He will be gone from the presence of God forever. And he will never have him or his dominions bother us again. I can't wait. Who's ready to go home? I'm ready to go home. And number 7. Adam walked with God, but it was interrupted in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, when he sinned through 10. We'll walk with God in Revelation 21, verse 3. It's going to be brought back. Number 8, I want you all to look at this one. I love this one. The initial triumph of the servant in Genesis 3, verse 13, but the ultimate triumph of the Lamb will be the last chapter of the Bible, and we will see that as he wins the day. I will greatly multiply your sorrow, Genesis 3, 16, because of this sin. But we just read in verse 4, hey, there's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more sorrow. No more pain, really. Number 9, curses the ground, Genesis 3, 17. 22, verse 3, there's, the curse is going to be removed. It's, it's very explicit on that. Number 10, man's dominion is broken, but it, man's dominion will be restored in chapter 22, verse 5. Number 11, the first paradise was closed and they were moved out, right? Genesis 3.23. But the new paradise of who God has restored things and brought this, he is preparing for this, us right now. Chapter 21, verse 25. Number 12, access to the tree of light is disinherited. Chapter Genesis 3.24, access to the three, tree will be reinstated. This is interesting to me. The tree being reinstated in Genesis 22, verse uh, in Genesis uh, 21 verse, or Genesis 22 verse 14. And, and, and 12 different fruits on that tree. Don't tell me we're not going to be eating in heaven. We're going to be eating. Okay? Number 13, my last one here. Driven from God's presence, the, the, the couple was in Genesis 3, 24. They shall see him face to face in Genesis, or Revelation 22 verse 4. Isn't that powerful? From the opposite of what happened in Genesis to the regathering back together. 
is what God has called us to do. And so we will see a full circle. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that this world is going to melt with fervent heat, but God will restore his promises and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And it will be pure and righteous. That's what Peter is saying. That's the full circle of what we live in now is Gotham. We will go towards Metropolis. How beautiful is that? Now, I gave you this scripture at the beginning. By the way, which city are you looking for? You looking for Gotham? A lot of people like it. Batman's way more popular than Superman. He's rich. Yeah. And Superman's corny. Okay? But in the cities, it seems like people drive to the smut, don't they? They live in, in the horror. They like it. Austin is a great example of this, isn't it? I had a lady. I asked, I asked a lady. To, she's 95 years old. I asked her this week. I said, when World War II broke out, I said, how old were you? She said, I was 16. She said, I remember it well. She said that when it broke out, we immediately got involved in collecting metal, our family, but I was actually in, in cataloging it all so that we knew it would go to munitions and, and be melted down for weapons. She said, we knew what we were doing had an impact, now get this, I want everybody looking up here, to stopping Satan. I said, you mean Hitler? She goes, right. She said, no doubt he was possessed by a demon. I said, you're right. She said, we were doing that. And we were all into that cause. And four and a half years later, I'm a young lady, and V-Day happened. And it was a great cost, but we did it. I asked her, I said, did anyone see that as the end of the world? She said, no, we didn't see this as Armageddon. I said, you didn't see this anything like prof prophetic things. That's like we hear now with all the stuff going on in Ukraine and everything else going on. They said, she said, no. She said, we saw it that we had a chance to stop the forces of hell. That simple. I said, she lived up in Massachusetts. Tuli knows her. I thought, how amazing. Strong believer, by the way. We don't think that now. We're throwing up our hands, saying we're on the Titanic and it's over. And I'm here to tell you, no, it's not. It's never over because our citizenship isn't here. It's up in heaven. And so I'm asking you again, what city are you looking for? Are you living in Gotham? Or are you looking for the true metropolis of what God's called us to do? And we can have an impact before this circle is completed. God wants us to have that. I believe with all my heart, he has wanted us to study heaven and understand our citizenship so that we can have power down here on earth while he tarries. And, and so this scripture is the one I started out with. For he was looking forward to the city, Abraham was, that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. God's <coughs> faith in Abraham is what Paul cited that helped him find salvation. Was it was faith that was imputed to him, Romans chapter 4, to righteousness. How much faith are you looking day in to day out of going home? But the writer of Hebrews doesn't stop there. Because he gives it a little bit further down and gives the explanation. I waited a few, a few moments to give this to you. These all died in faith. All these saints from the Old Testament, starting with Abraham, not having received the things promised. But now notice verse 13 in chapter 11. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, not your home. There's no dual citizenship here. For people who speak thus make it clear <laughs> They're seeking. What's that last word that says in, in verse number 14? They're seeking a what? Amen. That's your secret. That's being heavenly minded. Are you going home? Are you ready? The book ends with basically saying the same thing, but chapter 15, it says, if they've been thinking of that land, 
if they had been thinking of that land from which they'd gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. They were forgetting what's going on. They were not concentrating. Listen to me. They weren't concentrating on all the here and now. What you got to do tomorrow. What you're going to do today. What's for lunch when this loud preacher quits preaching? Their thinking was not about those things. They were trusting God. They would have returned. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a what? What's it say there in verse 16? A heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. How amazing. How powerful. Then comes chapter 12 in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable angels in festive gathering. And, and this scripture is so good because it's, it brings out how Jesus Christ brought us into the city. Verse 23. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That's going to be all the fellowship that we have and all the things that we're going to be doing on the new earth on, in the new city and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And we'll relate to that next week and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. How amazing is this? And churches have a weird language, don't they? You go to church, and if you've not been in church for a long time, you start hearing these religious words, and you start hearing all these words. One of the words that really tripped me up the year I got saved when I was 16 years old was the pastor would always be up front, and he'd say, now, back in the back, in the vestibule. Anybody ever heard that term before? Churches would have a vestibule. Maybe it was an East Coast thing. I don't know. Did anybody ever hear that term, vestibule? Okay, I always wonder, what does that mean? Well, this week I decided for the first time in good knows how many years, I looked it up. Vestibule. You know what it means? A preparing room to go into the big room. It's a preparation room. It's a smaller room. That's kind of like a landing you go into to prepare you to go into the big room. When it hit me, that's what a vestibule is. I said to myself, that's what earth is. It's a preparation. We all, always, in the vestibule, in the front of the church, we always saw the deacons in there and they'd be shaking people's hands, greeters, and they'd always be talking about sports and different things. And they would be talking about what's going on in their work and all of that. Now, it was a place the men hung out because they were about ready to pass the offering, right? But for us coming into the service, and eventually by the time the pastor got ready to preach, they would come in after the offering had been taken, they would all come in from the vestibule. They were preparing things, getting things ready. I mean, that's not good work. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. I get chills just thinking about it. This is our preparation. This is... What it says there, when you come to Mount Zion, look at verse 22, the city of the living God, the heavenly city, to an innumerable group of angels in festive gathering. You're going into the big room, your home. It is so exciting what God has prepared for us. I hope you need to read. think about it. Are you going home? Do you know him? It's the most exciting thing. And I'm praying that our church will get heavenly minded and that we're out of Gotham and we're in his metropolis. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our Father, we're thankful for this time. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had to worship you. And Lord, how that we're going to come into this festive gathering one day and that you are going to 